It's 9.30. We're going to go ahead and get started here. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully everybody had a great night's sleep last night. Today's a beautiful day. Uh, we have a lot of rain. It's still a great day today. I know the brethren in uh, Africa would love the rain that we're getting right now. So uh, it's a blessing to be able to have this rain. And so uh, it's a blessing to be here to uh, study the Word of God together, to worship our King together, and just to spend the day with brothers and sisters in Christ. We may have some guests here. I know we do. Thank you for being here. And our goal here is to teach the Word of God and to obviously live the things that we're teaching and, and reading in the Scriptures. So we encourage you to bring your Bible to uh, services, bring your Bible to Bible classes, because we are going to study from God's Word. So this quarter we're going through the book of Acts, the Actions of the Apostles. So if you have your Bible, open it up, please, to Acts chapter 8. We're going to do a quick, and I mean quick, review this morning, and then we need to wrap up uh, lesson number six, the workbooks are out in the foyer if you need one. We're going through a Bible survey, so we're getting uh, really a lay of the land in the book of, a lay of the land in the book of Acts, the actions of the apostles, the actions of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we find the church uh, when it began, the church that Christ established. And so we learn about that, and we're going to learn about conversion, about salvation in Jesus Christ, what men and women did. Uh, we're going to learn about uh, the work of the church. We're going to see the opposition that came upon God's people. And we're also going to see the growth of, of, of the church, the power of the gospel as the saints in the first century continue to teach and preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And so uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying the study. I want to encourage you, really make this study your own. Dive into it. Do Bible marking if you need to. Uh, write an outline of each chapter. Make your own notes for the book of Acts. I know we all have the workbook, but you get to decide really how much you really want to do with this class and with this study. And so really want to encourage everybody to take the time, go into the, uh, dive into the scriptures and, and spend some time because this is obviously all the books are important. So I don't want to say this is one of the most important books, but having a good understanding about the book of Acts really clears up so much of the confusion that a lot of people in the world have today. And so uh, let's make sure that we're studying the word of God. All right, let's begin with prayer and then a couple of action items and we'll dive into the scriptures. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful, Lord, for who you are. We're thankful, God, that we can come to you in prayer. We are thankful, Lord, that you hear our prayers we're thankful, God, that you are kind to us. We're thankful, Lord, that you are good and merciful to the just and to the unjust, that you allow the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. And we are thankful, Lord, that you bless us with so many blessings. We're thankful for this family that meets here at West Main. Continue, Lord, to be with this congregation. Be with us, Lord, and help us to be bold and courageous as we strive to do your will. Help us, Lord, to continue to stay united Help us, Lord, to continue to dive into your scriptures and to continue to draw closer to you each and every day. We pray this time, Lord, for those who are hurting in, uh, in Santa Fe, Texas, Lord, with the uh, event that took place there. We pray, Lord, that you will comfort those individuals at this time, that uh, doors of opportunities may be open for the gospel. And we pray, God, that you help us to continue to trust in you each and every day. We pray, Lord, for those who may be sick here that you will heal them, those who have strayed from the faith, that you will help us to uh, encourage them to return and to uh, give them opportunity to become right with you again. We thank you, Lord, for all the things you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so the book of Acts is uh, the actions of the apostles, and obviously we're seeing a lot of conversion stories, so this is always an opportunity to encourage you guys and to encourage all of us to pick up these cards. We've put together these, uh, these welcome cards, these visitor cards. I think one of the best way, if not the best way to, uh, when it comes to evangelism, is the power of the invitation. Whether you're inviting someone to study with you at your home, here at the congregation, inviting them to come out to services, uh, we really, uh, we want to really push that. And so look for those opportunities. And summertime is here, which means a lot of people are going on vacation. But you know what that means? It's not vacation from inviting people and talking to people, okay? So even when you're on vacation, take these cards with you. And uh, there was a sister back in uh, at Dallin Road. Her name was Trudy. Her name is Trudy. And um, she watched, I can't remember if I shared this uh, with you. She watched services for about seven months. And she came one Sunday morning. And she walked up during the invitation and said she needed to be baptized. 
And we had never even, we never sat down and studied with her, but she had been studying, listening to the sermons and listening to the things online for the last seven months. So I say that because just by giving somebody a card, they may listen to something on the website, a sermon on the website, a Bible class, so you never know. So let's look for those opportunities and uh, let's continue to uh, invite people to services. Okay, so let's look at Acts. Uh, and we're going to move kind of quickly here as we have to uh, wrap up uh, lesson number six, Acts chapter eight. So one of the things I've been doing, and one of the things you guys may be picking up on, I like to do a little bit of a review uh, before each class. I know there's a lot to, to cover, but I want to make sure that we're holding on to the information that we're studying. And so we're only looking at Acts once a week. So last week I asked you guys to summarize each chapter, right? And uh, if you could summarize Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, I want to encourage you guys to really think about that. Uh, You can do something a little bit shorter or a little bit maybe even a little bit easier if you had to pick one word or a couple of words to describe each chapter, what would you pick? So, for example, Acts chapter 1. What word or phrase might you use to help you to remember what took place in Acts chapter 1? Anything come to mind? Real quickly, go ahead. Holy Spirit, yeah, Holy Spirit. We see the promise of the Holy Spirit. We see Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. Anyone else? Ascension of Christ, yeah. So for Acts chapter 1, I put the ascension. Uh, You can put Holy Spirit. That's great. Acts chapter 2, what word or phrase would you put or uh, use to remember what took place? Go. Sermon, yes. It was a long sermon, too, which makes me feel even better about the length of my sermons. We don't even have all of Peter's words. With many other words, he he testified and exhorted them. So I feel much better about myself after reading Acts chapter 2. What else? Establishment of the church. Good. Anyone else? Good. Those are all good. I put uh, Pentecost. Uh, Obviously, that's going to entail the establishment of of the church. We have Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. What about Acts chapter 3? What happened in Acts chapter 3? Summarized in a couple of words or a word. What do you think? What do you got? Healing of the lame man. There you go. Healing of the lame man. There it is right there. That's what I put. Healing of the lame man. Good. Acts chapter 4. What would you say? Imprisonment. Imprisonment. Good. Yeah, I put uh, persecution. Same thing, right? Imprisonment. Acts chapter 5. What comes to mind? And you got it? Yeah, Ananias and Sapphira. Let me see if I put that. I'm pretty sure I did. Church discipline. All right, Ananias and Sapphira. Good. Acts chapter 6. What happened in Acts 6? What's widows cared for. Grecian widows cared for. Absolutely, yeah. The Grecian widows cared for. The needy widows. Good. Acts chapter 7. I hear something. I can't. Stephen, yeah, Stephen. Stephen's sermon, which makes me feel great, too. That was a long sermon, right? And now in uh, Acts chapter 8, uh, the saints are scattered. So let's look at Acts chapter 8. We need to wrap up Acts chapter 8. So we, we have this story that's continuing to uh, unfold before us, this, uh, this progress of the gospel. You remember back in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, the gospel was going to begin. Uh, the preaching would begin in Jerusalem, and then eventually it would go out to uh, the rest of the world. And so after Stephen, Stephen was, um, was killed. He was stoned to death by those Jews in Acts chapter 7. Uh, in Acts 7, in verse number uh, 54, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. They began gnashing their teeth at him. They would kill him because he preached the truth concerning Jesus. And so who was there in Acts chapter 7 that we're going to look at today in Acts chapter 9? It was Saul, yeah. So we're now introduced to Saul. And so we have uh, Peter and John emphasized in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4 and really all of the apostles in Acts chapter 5. We start to make a little bit of a transition in chapter 6. The apostles laid hands on men like Stephen and Philip and uh, five other men. They're now able to perform miracles. Now in Acts chapter 7, Stephen is martyred. He's killed uh, for preaching uh, the truth. Now in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women, and he, put, he, he would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. So despite persecution that arose, the word of God was still being proclaimed. The word of God was still being preached, okay? Uh, so in Acts chapter 8, uh, we find Philip. Where did Philip go? He went to... 
He went to Samaria, and that's a big deal, right? We were understanding the relationship that the Jews and the Samaritans had during that time. Somebody referenced John chapter 4 last week. So he went to Samaria, and what we find is that there was a man by the name of Simon the Sorcerer. Simon the Sorcerer in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 9, he was uh, uh, formally practicing magic in the city, astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. Now, Philip would go to Samaria, and the people would see real miracles, true miracles being performed. And as a result of that, they heard the gospel, and they would believe. In Acts chapter 8 and verse number 12, the Bible says, But when they believed Philip, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip, and as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. And so uh, the, the work of the Lord continues. Philip was one of the seven who the apostles laid hands upon in Acts chapter 6. He went down into, he went to Samaria. He's proclaiming the gospel. He's performing miracles. And yet Peter and John would have to go to Samaria. Why? Why would Peter and John have to go to Samaria? According to Acts chapter 8, what was the reason for as to why, the, why Peter and John went to Samaria? Yeah, so that they could impart gifts, so that those in Samaria, those Christians, could receive uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 8, verse number 14, Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. So they were imparting these spiritual gifts. We read more about those spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And now go back to verse number 18. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you, could not, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. Ouch. So Peter is very straightforward. Simon's soul was in jeopardy. We all agree with that? His soul was in jeopardy. He was a Christian. Now his soul is in jeopardy. His heart was not right before the Lord. And so what Simon told him, what Peter told him, was to, to, to repent. And so that's where we ended uh, in Acts chapter 8 last, last Sunday. Any questions about that? Any comments about that before we move forward? Go ahead, sir. Yes. Verse 12, that Philip preaches. You know, we hear a lot of misconceptions about the kingdom today, and I think all of us here understand the church. Moving farther to the left. Well, let's just preach more about Christ and not the church. See from the preaching of John the Immerser, the preaching of Jesus, coming, and chapter 1 in Acts, what did Jesus speak during the 40 days? Things here when Philip went in. Absolutely. Yeah. Amen to that. Uh, that's very important for us and very important for people to understand and uh, helping people to understand, you know, uh, what's been established, uh, the rule and reign of Christ. Absolutely. Uh, and Acts chapter nine, too, that's going to come up because Jesus is going to speak to Paul and he's going to say, you've been persecuting me. Well, how is he persecuting him? Well, he's, uh, he had been persecuting the church. And so that becomes really important as well. Uh, <laughs> excellent thought. All right, let's look back in Acts chapter 8 now. Let's read verses 26. Let's start in verse number 26. The Bible says, But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. That This is a desert or deserted road. road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candice, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. 
And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, well, how, can, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So if you go back and, and look in your workbook under lesson number six here, there are some questions uh, that, uh, that I think would be good for us to discuss briefly here. We won't look at every single one of them. But look at question number eight. As we talk about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, what was the role of the angel in the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch? What do we see there? I just read it. You guys help me out here this morning. Go ahead, brother. And, uh, for the opportunity, to go and, and preach to this eunuch. So he helped provide the opportunity, yet he didn't teach him the gospel. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, and I think that's important because we see the, the teaching and preaching of the gospel in the hands of men, uh, that God told the apostles to go out and teach and preach. And so while we find uh, uh, Philip being guided to go to the eunuch, Philip would ultimately have to do the teaching. And the same thing happens today, right? Uh, I certainly believe in the providence of God. I think you guys believe in the providence of the Lord, people who are searching, uh, people who are looking for the truth. Those opportunities are going to uh, be open to us or open for them. Uh, and yet this opportunity still falls upon uh, uh, men and women to, uh, to teach those who are, who are searching. So what do we learn about the Ethiopian eunuch? Just that brief little summary there that we have of him. What do you think about this man? What qualities did he have? What, what type of mindset does he have? Absolutely, yeah. He's spiritually minded. He, he, was, he had traveled to Jerusalem. He's reading from Isaiah. Or you got to say that. I'm sorry, I took your answer. Yeah, so he, he certainly is spiritually minded here, and, and he's interested in, in learning. And so the Spirit said to Philip, you go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him. This is a Philip from Acts chapter 6. Uh, this is not the apostle, but Philip the evangelist. And so uh, the eunuch is reading from Isaiah. What chapter is he reading from? Isaiah chapter 53. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 53. So look at verse number 31 again. He said, how could I unless someone guides me and he invited Philip to come up and sit with him? I think we learned something else about this man real quickly. He had a great heart. I need a little bit of help here. One of the biggest challenges sometimes is people to admit, I need a little bit of help. I don't understand this. Uh, and so that's a mindset that all of us should have. We want, that, we want the same mindset uh, for people in the world to have, the same mindset that we should have. And so watch what Philip does here. Verse 32, now the passage of Scripture, which he was reading, was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation, for his life is removed from the earth? The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does a prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. So, at question number 10, was the Ethiopian saved before Philip came to him? The answer to that is no, he wasn't. Now, he certainly was a spiritual-minded man. He was religious. Uh, he's, he's worshiping God. He's reading the scriptures. Something else that's interesting, too, he has a copy of Isaiah 53, which I think is kind of fascinating. That's a whole other lesson or sermon one day. Uh, but nonetheless, he needed to be taught the truth concerning Jesus Christ. And so what we find when you look at those verses here uh, is that Philip, he begins by talking about Jesus. Sometimes we ask ourselves or want, want to know, I'm in a Bible study with someone. Where should I begin? Well, start where they are. Start with Jesus. That's always a pretty safe answer. <laughs> Talk to people about Jesus. Uh, help people to understand who is this man. That's what Philip did here. Go ahead. Yeah. So this teaches me sometimes that we think about not being partial, but we don't. We should be partial in any. That's a great point. And we can't assume that people know. We can't assume that people aren't willing to, to take help if, if, if asked. And so this eunuch, yeah, powerful man, he needed some help. So question 11, what was the spirit's role in the conversion of the Ethiopian? Um, did it agree with earlier evidence, especially from Acts 2, concerning the manner in which the spirit works to bring out the conversion of sinners? What was the spirit's role here? How would you, how'd you guys answer that? 
All right. What do you think? Go ahead, Linda. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think we see again the providence of the Lord. And this man's heart was convicted by the words of the Holy Spirit. And just as in Acts 2, Peter's preaching the gospel. He's preaching uh, the death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, that, this goes back to John chapter 16, verses 8, uh, 8 9, 10, and 11, uh, that the Holy Spirit is going to convict. And so, how does the Holy con Spirit convict? It's going to be through the teaching of His Word. And that's exactly what we find here. So, a couple of powerful points. You want people to learn the truth, talk to them about Jesus. Start in the scriptures. Never assume that people know certain things that you may think they should know. Uh, we need to start where they are, find out, do you need some help? Hey, if you really want to be bold, this week, if you see somebody reading their Bible, ask them, do you understand what you're reading? There's your challenge, okay? Now, that's what Philip did, and obviously this may be a little bit of a unique case, but asking questions is something that's really powerful. Philip did that. And we're going to see this all throughout the, the book of Acts. Uh, Paul would do that in Acts chapter 19. Uh, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Priscilla and Aquila did that with, with uh, Apollos. They pulled him aside and explained to him. And so there's some opportunities here for us. And so verse number 35, Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Now, I don't know how long this chariot ride was. <laughs> I don't know how long it was, but nonetheless, he's going to preach to Preach to him Jesus. Now, verse number 36, as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. All right, so you go back to our, work, our workbook here. Uh, question number 14, what are some things that must be taught when one preaches Jesus? What's the author trying to get at there? I, I think he's trying to look at, help us to see that baptism is something that should naturally be taught. You think about what Jesus taught about individuals being born again, uh, about uh, baptism. Jesus said a lot about this, and obviously... If he's reading Isaiah 53, he's going to learn about the sacrifice of Jesus. He's going to learn that Jesus lived a sinless life. He's going to learn that he was killed, that he died uh, as an innocent sacrifice, that he was a sinless uh, man, uh, and that he rose from the grave. This is all going to be included as he begins to teach and talk to him about Jesus, and he's going to make the connection about baptism about how to put on Christ, about how to have fellowship with Christ. And so I think that's something really important here. Don't ever be ashamed to talk about baptism, and don't be ashamed to talk about what Jesus says concerning baptism. This is what Philip taught, and the book of Acts shows us time and time again that baptism is essential to salvation. Dane? Oh, uh, <clears throat> just as verse 37 ends, the, as you went through your list of who Jesus is, Vitally important because in the religious world, what we fail to establish is any other religious leader, Jesus came as a man that was always the Son of God. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Philip Tyler asked him, If you answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Mm -hmm. Jesus right there with God. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and demonstrating his allegiance to the Lord, recognizing who he is. So think about that. You know, the Philip is using Isaiah 53 and he's he's teaching him the good news. And obviously he's going to teach him what happened in the life of Jesus. And so just some really powerful thoughts for us to consider. Talk about making application don't be ashamed of these conversion stories. Walk people through these stories. Many people are not familiar with these stories. Here that the immersion that's right <laughs> yeah that's right yeah they both did that's right and so you know baptism there's a lot of confusion that's what I'm actually talking about this morning and, and so when we talk about baptism we're not talking about infant sprinkling uh, that's that's not that's not baptism 
Uh, that's not what the scriptures teach. And this idea about the sinner's prayer, uh, it's, it's a prayer never found. Uh, but there's a lot of misunderstanding of why a person needs to be baptized. First, Philip had to teach the eunuch about Jesus, help him to understand some things. And so, as Ken preached, I got Ken's notes in my Bible. And next to verse number 35, I put facts, right? So he taught him the facts about Jesus. Verse number 36 and 37, I got faith. He believed those facts concerning Jesus. And then verse number 40, I put feelings. That was in, that was in your sermon too, right? I'm taking notes, man. All right, facts, faith, feelings, okay? And so you should be excited when a person is saved, when a person is converted. Hopefully the person who's converted is fired up and excited, and hopefully we are too. We get excited about so many things, right? Uh, summertime, you guys excited about it being summer? Yes. All right. Vacation. Anybody going on vacation soon? Maybe you got a new house. Maybe you got a new job. We get fired up about these things. Nothing wrong with that. But let's be sure that we get fired up, too, with souls being saved. And how is that going to begin? That begins with everyone in this audience. We got to get out there, and we got to start talking. And we got to continue to talk, and we got to continue to look for those opportunities. I think question number 18, uh, what did Philip do following this encounter with the Ethiopian? He kept on going. (laughs) There's more work to do. And so uh, we don't get satisfied. We don't get content. Yes, we're happy. We're thrilled. All glory goes to the Lord. But we continue to preach the gospel. Yes, sir. I always look at this and think, you know, that it wasn't necessarily the easy thing. You know, the, the Holy Spirit could. Absolutely, yeah. We need to spread the gospel wherever we can, whenever we can, to whoever uh, you know has those uh, opportunities. Look, is everybody going to obey the gospel? We know the answer to that. The answer is no. I think one of the best examples is Acts chapter 17. Paul was in Athens. A few of them believed. Some of them mocked him. Some of them said, maybe we'll come back and hear you another time. So we're not being naive to say everybody's going to obey if we just talk to them or give them a card. That's not what I'm saying at all. But it starts by changing our mindset that we, when we look for those opportunities, we talk to enough people, eventually we're going to find, we're going to come upon a, a, a heart that is soft, a heart that's been searching for the truth, a heart that is willing to listen. I went to Walmart yesterday, <laughs> and I gave the woman at the checkout line and the checkout a card. So when they give me a receipt, I give them a card, right? They're going to give me something. I have to give them something. That's the kind thing to do, right? Be kind. So I gave her a card. And the only thing I say is, come visit me sometime. So she actually responded and said, what do you mean? You're like, where? Or for what? And I said, well, for a Bible study. And, uh, and I said, do you, do, you, um, do you read the Bible? And she said, no. And I said, do you own a Bible? And she said, yeah. I said, well, I'd love for you to come out. I'd love to sit down and, and, and share with you the Bible story, kind of help you understand something. She said, I went, I've, I went to church all my life growing up. I said, Okay. And then I walked away because it was just kind of, it was, it was a weird encounter, right? She doesn't read the Bible, even though she went to church all of her life. So I don't know, maybe she will visit. That would be great if she came and visited. Uh, but, you know, you never know. So anyway, you look for those opportunities. No matter how a person responds, let's give them some opportunities. Anything else from Acts chapter 8 before we look into Acts chapter 9? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, he wasn't converted. And yeah, I think a lot of people would look at it that way. Why, why, would the, why does this man need to be baptized? Uh, but maybe another question too, why does he need help? He's reading, he's worshiping. There's still, there was still room for him to grow. And so um, that's one of the powerful things 
in, in the book of Acts, all the different stories, the, the priest being converted in Acts 6 and verse 7, who would have thought that those men would have been converted of all people? But they were. And so we give everybody an opportunity. All right, let's look at Acts chapter 9 here. Uh, Acts chapter 9 and lesson number 8. I'm sorry, lesson number 7. Okay, uh, lesson number 7. To, so we're going to talk about the conversion of Saul. So let's look at uh, verse number 1. Let's do a little bit of reading, then we'll dive into the questions here. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was there, I'm sorry, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he's seen a vision, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you are coming, by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. So we read about the story or the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Very important story when we think about Paul and the influence that he had uh, upon Christianity. So let's just kind of look at some of the questions here. We'll kind of make our way through these questions to kind of guide us with our discussion. Question number one, how was Saul an example of what Jesus predicted in John chapter 16, verses 1, 2, and 3? What was it that Jesus predicted in chapter 16, verses 1, 2, and 3? What did Jesus predict? Anybody read that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Those who would uh, persecute and kill. That, yeah, that's, and Jesus was talking to his apostles. <laughs> and so uh, Saul was certainly fulfilling those words that Jesus said. He said, they will make you outcast from, from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God, which is interesting because, go ahead. Paul says he's done everything in his life left. Yeah. 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 Saul thought he was doing the right thing. And listen, he, he's zealous for the Lord. He was zealous for Judaism. And you think about who are some of those examples in the Old Testament who were zealous and described as being zealous and went to great extremes to, you know, to make sure that idolatry was not being introduced or, or got rid of certain things like that. You read about some powerful men in the Old Testament. Any of those men come to mind that Paul may have been saying, look, they did that. I'm going to do the same thing to these individuals who are promoting and living the way, talking about Jesus, saying that he has risen from the grave. Give me one. Josiah, yeah, Josiah. Give me, uh, who's another one? Anyone? Yes, I I thought about Phineas the priest. I think that's in Numbers 24 or 25 where he saw some of the uh, Israelite men uh, engaging in sexual immorality, and, you know, he just started killing people. (laughs) <laughs> and then uh, Elijah, somebody mentioned Elijah. Yeah, think about all the, the false prophets that he destroyed. And so Paul, he's thinking here, when you go back to Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 23, and it's interesting how many times or just how often 
Paul would recount his story about what he did in the book of Acts and obviously throughout the epistles. So Saul, thought, Saul which would become Paul, he thought, listen, I'm, I'm doing the will of the Lord. And what Jesus said in John 16, we see uh, this, was, uh, this is what was taking place. So what, to what extreme did Paul, Saul go in his opposition to the, to the disciples, and what was his motivation? How would you guys answer that question? Not only was he trying to eliminate the blasphemers, what he thought were blasphemers in Jerusalem, but he received authority from the high priest to go to Rome in Damascus. Yeah, he's traveling, and he's going to go... Uh, he might bind them, bind them to Jerusalem. Uh, he's traveling. He's going after these Christians. Well, go ahead. Uh, you know, Acts 5 says what they ought to do is leave them alone. Two, he's, he was taught by mentor. He went against yeah. Not to do. Yeah. So he's he, he's moving, and there, there's nothing that's going to stop him. That's right. So what was the purpose of the Lord's appearance to Saul? That's question number three. How'd you guys answer that? What was the purpose of that? <coughs> Excuse me, Joanna? Yeah, I think that's it. I think uh, to demonstrate that indeed he had risen. Um, Paul's trying to figure out what's going on. It's interesting. I've been listening to the book of Acts, uh, driving to, to the building and back to the building throughout the week. And I was listening to Acts chapter 10. And when Cornelius, when the angel spoke to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, um, he had the same response, I believe, this idea of, you know, what is it, Lord? Uh, let me see if I'm correct with that. Uh, hold on a second here. Uh, now it's in my mind. Uh, yeah, the angel came to him. Yeah, in verse 4 in Acts 10, he said, what is it, Lord? Uh, and it's a, it's a question. So it's like trying to figure some things out. Uh, and so in Acts chapter 9, uh, he hears his voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Which is interesting. How was Saul persecuting Jesus? Yeah, by persecuting his people. I think there's something powerful about that, uh, about um, that relationship. The people of God were suffering. Jesus said, you're persecuting me. Go ahead. In chapter 10, we have an angel intervening to put people together. Here we have the Lord. Yeah. He doesn't teach you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, uh, we find uh, Jesus um, interacting with Paul here. He doesn't teach him, uh, but he does help him to see, I am, uh, you know, I'm alive. Look at Acts chapter 9. He said, I am Jesus, verse 5, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. Very important as well as we talk about conversion. How do you think that would have... How did, what do, you, what do you think might have been going through the mind of Saul when he's hearing this, when he's hearing from Jesus? I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Go ahead. God. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. His eyes are open, even though they're, yeah, his eyes are open. <laughs> his eyes are open, even though his eyes would be shut. Yeah, that's right. Can you imagine the shock that he would have, that he would experience? Don't forget, he was there when Stephen was stoned to death, and he has this, he has this opportunity to go and travel and uh, to bind those of the way, uh, which is interesting too. Uh, Brian talked a little bit about that in the invite uh, Wednesday, the way, the saints being described as the way. There was something unique and distinct about them, and people could understand that these were followers of Jesus Christ. And so while the Lord appeared to Saul, certainly he still needed to obey uh, the gospel. He still needed to, uh, to be taught what he needed to do to be saved. Acts 22 and verse number 16 uh, helps us to understand that along with the rest of, of Acts chapter 9. Question number five, what does it mean that Saul was a chosen vessel? I think this is important when we look at the rest of the book of Acts and really the epistles. What would make Saul, and I took some notes here. I'm looking at them on my phone, so I don't want you to think I'm texting or posting anything on Facebook, okay, during Bible class. But what would make Saul, who would become Paul, such a unique vessel or one to go and proclaim the gospel? What comes to mind? Yes, ma'am. 
And so number one, he was zealous. And so he's going to carry that zeal from Judaism that he had uh, into Christianity. That's one thing. Good. What else? He was, he was very and highly educated. Uh, Steve, you just mentioned he was trained under, uh, got nervous. <laughs> he was trained under Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5. And he would have spent a lot of time in Jerusalem. And I believe Paul would have fallen under the category as a Hellenistic Jew, uh, which would become really important too when, it, when you think about his ministry going out to uh, the Jews and to the Gentiles. And just the, the, the Jews that he would be speaking to in Acts chapter 9, I was listening to this again on my phone, uh, as he began proclaiming, he would go to um, the synagogues, and many of those synagogues, uh, had uh, the Hellenistic Jews in Acts 9 and verse 29. He was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. And so Saul's going to be the perfect person to go out and share the gospel. What languages would he have known? If he's trained under, what did you say? Yeah, yeah. Aramaic, he would have known Greek, he would have known Hebrew. So he, he's going to be able to, to, to cover all bases. And he's trained under Gamaliel. He has Roman citizenship. We're going to learn about that. Maybe he got that from his father or grandfather. Maybe they purchased that. Uh, but he's, he's a perfect person uh, to go out and to proclaim the gospel and to do uh, the work of God. Anything else that comes to mind with respect to Saul as a chosen vessel? Yes, sir. I would say to prepare my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. He went out and he brought it out to the whole world because the message was always for the whole world. But Paul, he wasn't the first, Peter was the first, but Peter, we see in Acts chapter two, in, Gal in Galatians chapter 2, mm -hmm. yeah. So Paul in his boldness is the one that can is that was more effective at overcoming his prejudice and taking it out to everyone in the world. It yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So overcoming those uh, some some prejudice that some of the Jews struggled with. I think that's a great example, Galatians two, where he had to correct Peter. Excellent comment, excellent point, and that connection that he had. You know, being a Roman citizen and being around uh, so many different kinds of uh, of individuals that, that would have been perfect for him. Yeah, that's right. He preached to a slave. That's right. So um, was Paul? S oh, go ahead. You got two minutes. <laughs> 659 is entitled channels only okay. just as Paul was to be a vessel to carry God's message and pour it out to the world yeah. to be channels through which God's message flows yeah. Galatians 2.20 uh, references, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who dwells. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to do the same thing. And while Paul was unique, he was uh, an apostle, uh, called out of due season, he would have the same power that the other apostles would have. Um, we still have the gospel. We have the words of Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit to go out and teach individuals. So with the time remaining, let's make sure we understand a couple of things. Paul saw Jesus. He hears him speaking to him. Was he saved at that moment? He was not. Ananias is going to have to go to him and, and tell him what he needed to do. So the language we find in verse number 17 when Ananias referred to him as brother Saul, I think he's just talking about their Jewish, uh, Jewish connection. So what we find is that Paul is going to do the same thing to be saved as other individuals did in the first century. He certainly believed <laughs> that Jesus was risen from the grave, and he would also be baptized uh, into Jesus Christ. That's what we find in Acts chapter 9 and verse number 18. And so after he is converted, uh, he begins. And we find in verse number 19, he begins to associate with the disciples at Damascus, which is something I think is really powerful. After you become a Christian, you need to align yourself with other Christians in a local area. He aligned himself with the saints in Damascus. And what's the response? When people hear Saul preaching that Jesus is the Son of God, they're, uh, how do they respond? They can't believe it. They, there's a clear distinction between who he used to be 
and who he is now. And so he, he's, 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 he's zealously saying that Jesus is the Son of God. And as a result of that, he's going to face some opposition, right? And so that really is the first uh, 19 to 23 verses here. We've got to stop. We'll finish this up, uh, Lord willing, next week. But I want you to go back and really think about the Apostle Paul and, and think about the conversion in Acts chapter 8. We see a pattern here, a pattern of what men and women did to be saved. And we see uh, individuals talking to people, and we see the power of God uh, at work. And so let's be confident in the power of the gospel. Let's be confident with what we have in Jesus Christ, and let's be sure that we share that with others. So make sure for Sunday that you look at lesson number 8. Lesson number 8, we'll look at Acts chapter 10 and 11. And then this Wednesday, Lord willing, for our psalm study, um, read all of Psalm 119. I promise you I will not read that in class, okay? <laughs> we will not have time. That would be the only thing that we do if we did, okay? So come prepared on Wednesday for Psalm 119. Thank you, guys.